Welcome everyone. We are officially live for our conversation on climate justice as part of the B-Lab Climate Collective Conference. And we are really excited to have all of you here. Thank you for taking the time to connect with us from all across the world to have a really important conversation for the broader B-Lab community. And so with that, I would love to do a quick round of introductions so that everyone can get to know our incredible panelists that we have here today. And so we will do a quick round robin of introductions and we will start with Fatima. Hi, hello. Thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. I'm Fatima. Uh, I'm the video strategist at Ecosia.org. We're uh, a search engine that plants trees, also the first uh, B Corp in Germany. Which is, so it's really great to be here with the community. Um, yes, as the video strategist, I'm a climate justice journalist, but very specifically as a video strategist at Ecosia, my goal is to um, pass on not just the mic, but literally the uh, camera, the microphones and uh, everything to the tree planting uh, communities that we work with on the ground all across the world, um, visiting them, making sure that uh, through the trees that we plant there, we're actually helping them and uh, letting them tell us their stories and our community of users. Um, so that is most recently my my goal in, in life. Wonderful, thank you, Mark. Hi, my name is Mark Cook. I live in Tucson, Arizona in the Southwest United States where our summers are getting hotter, longer and drier. The organization I belong to is Elders Climate Action, which is mostly regular volunteer elders focused on climate and actions. Our actions include education, collaborative climate activism, with other climate justice organizations, including interfaith and youth groups and, and legislative and policy shaping and advocacy. Our actions are rooted in the vision for equitable climate action, which was drafted by the United States Climate Action Network, which is an umbrella organization of nearly 200 climate related organizations, including Elders Climate Action. The vision for equitable Climate action is a multi-sector policy framework, a partial list of the sectors that are both standalone and intersectional, include agriculture, transportation, equity and justice, renewable electricity, infrastructure, and natural solutions. Last fall, B Corps were highlighted on a national call as a critical business sector solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next to David. Hi everyone, this is David Chen. I'm Darling from Singapore. Uh, I am the co-founder of Golden Sunland and the brand owner for the Little Rice Company. So we are actually one of the few B Corps in the rice sector. And back in 2016, we embarked on a whole value chain approach in the Myanmar rice sector, uh, working with the underserved smallholder rice farmers to produce sustainable rice for the consumers. The key driving forces behind our work are the need for rural transformation sustainable production and consumption. So the biggest question people always ask is why rice? Um, you know, rice interestingly is a staple to more than half of the global population, but also a key methane producers among the agricultural crops. So the rice farmers whom we work with are actually both contributors and victims of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next on to Gladys. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gladys Kivati. I lead a team at Sustainable Business Consulting. We are one of the pioneering big corps in Africa and uh, we were established back in 2016 and got certified around 2019. Um, what we mainly do is we support businesses integrate sustainability into their business model, as well as uh, uh, run operations that are looking at key sustainability metrics. We also work along with investors uh, because one of our focus area is ESG advisory. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance. And we work a lot with, uh, with stakeholders in trying to ensure that decisions are made to integrate um, climate justice as well as integrate uh, sustainability, um, uh, sustainability uh, factors into their business. And so we are so happy to be here. I'm dialing it from Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Next over to Marita. 
Hi, my name's Marita Davies. I'm uh, Ikinibus, an Australian writer. I'm dialing in from um, the Indigenous lands of the Tungurung people in Australia, near Melbourne. Um, I am a writer who I have written a children's book that talks about um, the Kiribati people battling um, the effects of rising seawaters and what life is currently like and has been for a while in Kiribati. Um, so my, I see my life's work as to share the stories and culture of Kiribati people. I'm from the Indigenous islands of um, Tabatawea North and Madake. And I am also a writer for a strategic consultancy um, tank who are based in Melbourne and they are also a people. Thank you so much. Next over to Mitzi. Hi everyone, so I'm Mitzi Jonel Tan, a youth climate activist based in Metro Manila, Philippines. And I organize with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines and a lot of our work revolves around raising awareness about the climate crisis, but also doing a lot of strikes and um, really showing the urgency of the climate crisis and that we need youth-led collective action for system change and to always defend environmental defenders, mainly our indigenous peoples, our farmers, our small fisher folk, um, and remembering that climate justice activism is about centering and uplifting the most marginalized voices and that development has to be development for all. Great, right, thank you, Mitzi. Next over to Rashid. Good morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Rashid Ajamu. I curate the Freedom Join page on Instagram, which is the hub to essentially just help elevate opportunities and stories for Black Philadelphians. And my hope is to inform Philadelphians um, to help create connections on how climate justice can also be racial justice. Thank you so much. Next to Renee. Hola, mi nombre es Renee Calpanchay. Pertenezco a la comunidad indígena de Susques, pueblo de Atacama, con territorio entre 3.600 y 6.000 metros sobre el nivel del mar. Es el territorio andino y también el más seco del mundo y el segundo más inhóspito. Eh, desde niño he trabajado en la comunidad, afortunadamente he aprendido a valorar lo escaso, como es el oxígeno, como es el agua dulce, porque vivo en un territorio que es de... De, de, de Salinas, un territorio salado. Eh, hace tres años eh, hemos co-creado y actualmente soy el presidente del sistema Pueblos Originales, que trata de... Hello everybody, my name is René Calpanchay. I am from the indigenous community of Susques in the Atacama region. This is an Andes region, which is the, uh, the first driest territory on earth and the second most inhospitable. For this reason, since I was a child, I've come to value that which is scarce, such as oxygen and uh, fresh water because our territory is mostly salt water saline. And for the past three years, I've been working with a group that I co-created and I'm now president called Original People. A través de este sistema, queremos convidar al mundo algunas herramientas que podemos aportar desde los saberes de los pueblos indígenas, porque nosotros no tuvimos la oportunidad de ir a la universidad pero sí de sentir y administrar lo escaso, de valorar lo que es importante para poder realizar los procesos de cambio. Y eso es lo que me ha motivado participar de esta reunión, valorar la diversidad, valorar la armonía, valorar los objetivos eh, sustentables, los 17 ODS, pero también nosotros poder convidar con alegría los tres OBB, que son los tres objetivos del buen vivir como complemento a los 17 o, o B, ODS. Through this system, we want to um, invite the world um, so that we can 
collaborate from the knowledge produced by indigenous populations because indigenous populations did not have the opportunity to go to university. However, we have learned to administer that which is scarce and to value that which is scarce. Uh, um, and this is important when we're talking about process of change. Uh, and this is also why I'm excited to be part of this conversation, um, a conversation that values diversity, that values harmony, and that values both the sustainable goals, um, the 17 sustainable goals, but also that can value like the, the joy that with which we work and what we know as the goals of the good living. Thank you so much. To Coria. Hello, my name is Tecoria Jackson. I'm dialing in from Maryland. Um, I um, am calling on behalf of the Howard County NAACP, where I co-chair their Environmental Climate Justice Committee. Um, I also help um, manage our community garden, our George Washington Carver uh, Growing Food Together CSA, uh, which is basically like a teaching garden uh, where we're dedicated to uh, one, mitigating food insecurity by providing communities uh, with fresh produce and also teaching them how to grow their own produce. Um, I also collaborate with our Howard County Conservancy to increase uh, climate justice education in the Howard County public school system. Um, so I would say that I have, uh, I take a special interest in one, like the community engagement and community education side of climate justice, but also, uh, working on like a local policy level, uh, to help reduce a lot of those racial equity gaps, um, especially as it relates to like resource allocation, um, and just climate vulnerability in general for black and brown communities. Thank you all so much for those introductions. And just to round us out, my name is Dan Eagle, and I am the very privileged and fortunate moderator of today's conversation. And I'm joined by uh, Dr. Alonda Williams from B Lab, the Jedi Director. Alonda, anything else you want to add? Not at all. Continue. Okay. So we're going to dive into four questions that we've asked uh, about climate justice, particularly from different lenses and perspectives here from amongst our panelists. We'll do a round robin for each of the four questions and in between each of those round robin sets, people will have an opportunity to ask questions of their fellow panelists. So the first of our four questions is, what is the most important thing for the business community to understand about the impacts of climate change on your community? And we'll start off again with Fatima. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think from the perspective of because yeah I would claim that our community is twofold right we have like on the one hand uh, our users the ones that are aware of our product and use it every day uh, who are usually in settled in urban areas around the world uh, and then we have on the other side uh, rural communities that we work with and whom we plant the trees with um, and I think what's important in that sense for the business community to understand, uh, which is something that we've that we've also had to learn ourselves over the years, and that we've like um, also seen uh, over the years, um, especially in the tree planting industry to be a, a, a little bit of a misunderstanding in a way, or a, for us perspective that doesn't quite. Uh, makes sense is that, especially, uh, sorry, it's a bit of a completed answer, but especially in the past years, maybe, or in the past year, is uh, very particularly tree planting has become uh, a big trend. A lot of companies uh, are planting trees. And um, in that sense, that business community, perhaps one thing that we would like to uh, bring closer to them in terms of climate justice and how to work with communities with whom they plant trees is that they these communities need to be involved. Um, the tree planting seems easy. It sounds very easy. It sounds like you're just digging a hole in the in the in the ground and then you're just planting a tree it's not that easy and if we it, it, there's a lot of harm that what can do to nature if you plant trees uh just by um let's say financing uh, seeds or uh, saplings to be planted planted versus speaking to the communities and understanding 
what type of landscapes they live in, why the landscape was deforested, um, what pressures are uh, economic pressures, social pressures are on them, but that then uh, um, cause these deforestations or force them in a way sometimes also to to harm their own land in order to survive. So uh, in terms of the business community at large and specifically the, the communities perhaps or businesses that, that are planting trees or uh, are planning to plant trees, that this is something that we're very adamant about to understand that it's not as easy to as just finding some financing some trees and hoping that these will be put in the ground. That, will probably happen, but you need to look into um, what trees are being planted, uh, why uh, the community uh, doesn't want certain trees to be planted because it's an invasive species or because the monoculture is starting to, to appear around there. So um, perhaps this is uh, very much focused on trees uh, in our particular case, but um, this would be something that we were, that I would really like to underline uh, because we've seen the harm that um, that is made to communities if we don't take into account that it's not all just about the trees when you plant trees, but about the landscape and the people around that uh, around that, those trees and those forests and the wildlife, making sure that we're also thinking of how to preserve the, the wildlife and let them exist in those forests. Thank you so much, Fatima. On to Mark. After this first question, uh, the next three panel questions all specifically mention the words climate justice. So maybe the most important thing for the business community to understand is the meaning and the extra work of climate justice and avoidance of what I'll call double jeopardy. As the pandemic and policing have revealed here, marginalized communities suffer disproportionately from multidimensional inequities, for example, Regarding the pandemic, short-term fixes like moratoriums on rent and utilities produce longer-term problems of enduring, debt, of enduring debt. On climate change, tax credits for solar panels and electric cars don't help exploited communities who struggle to pay their rent and utilities. Businesses need help to clearly summarize climate justice in order to understand it. This is extra work beyond convincing them that there is a climate crisis, then taking commensurate actions for mitigation and resilience. And finally, ensuring that those who have suffered most from climate change don't suffer the double jeopardy of getting the least from any opportunities and relief that climate mitigation and resilience can offer. All boats have to be floated, not yachts for some and swimming lessons for the rest. If it doesn't get overlooked, climate justice comes through the first actions of recognition and then through mitigation and resilience. This is why climate justice is extra work, even just to understand. On to David. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I, I think what you just shared leads quite well into what, what I was gonna share. So uh, in our case, specifically uh, the business community first need to understand that they are part of the problem and the reason why the existing rice industry uh, despite being the most important staple crop in the world is highly unsustainable from all angles and um, it's, it's a crucial mindset shift because we are always better positioned to make holistic decisions when our own interest and well-being is on the line so similar to what Fatima was sharing with the tree planting we tend to simplify problems and we simplify problem because we are approaching this problem from the point of sympathy. But what we really need is the sense of em empathy where we could empathize that we are also part of the problem. Therefore, when we make a decision, uh, we are able to make decisions that would truly be impactful to the, all the community that's involved uh, in, in our sector. So I'm gonna pass it on to the next person. Great, next we're on to Gladys. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dan and everybody. So yeah, uh, so we've seen that climate change is having a very uh, growing impact in the African continent. And of course, we've seen its effect is hitting the most vulnerable, uh, you know, causing 
leading to say food insecurity, population displacement, as well as stress on water resources. And, and I think one important thing that um, the business community need to understand is there's really no trade-off between economic growth and climate change. Why is this? Uh, for a continent, say for instance, like Africa, uh, we've seen there's really been um, a lot of growth in terms of the economy. We've seen the GDP of, of certain countries, like for instance, why I'm in Kenya, we've seen uh, GDP uh, increasing. And of course, with this increased GDP, uh, as well as you know, well-being of communities or even the business uh, environment really thriving, we see that risks uh, that are associated with climate change keep going higher because economic growth is associated with increased emission of greenhouse gases. And as a result, there's more of deepening uh, climate change crisis. So we've seen that really businesses can disassociate themselves or really uh, think of, hey, can I uh, can I not think around climate change even as I'm doing my day-to-day -day operations? We work a lot with small and growing businesses. And sometimes, of course, they are more keen on survival. They are more keen on how can I actually be able to, to thrive in this, in this ecosystem? And so a topic like climate justice, a topic like climate change is not really top of their priorities. But then you've seen countries really uh, going, uh, being affected. Uh, we also work a lot with, 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 with businesses across Africa. I can give you an example of a business we are working right now with Mozambique. We've seen how, say, the cyclone and 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 the, uh, in 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 Mozambique really has affected, you know, this particular enterprise. And this is just a case study, but then in generally, they really are, uh, the climate change issue has affected their GDP, and we've seen that their public debt has increased by 110 percent. Why is this important? Where does a business actually sit in this in this type of ecosystem? We realize that even as economies keep growing, keep thriving, risks keeps increasing. So I think it's it's a matter of the business community rethinking how do they actually adapt to the growing risks that are that are brought about uh, with economic growth. And in this case and scenario, we are talking about issues to do with climate change, and of course with countries that are really not. Um, prepare to deal with the consequences of climate change, which most of them are in the African continent, they really need to build their resilience on how they can effectively adapt and redesign their business models to really uh, become resilient and, and of course uh, thrive and of course ensure that they're they are sustainable in their operations in the long run, both economically and, and, and and socially and even as you go further, I think we'll talk about where does climate justice actually come into this whole discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gladys. Next, we have Marita. Um, I'm going to, I'm speaking today with my Kiribati hat on rather than an Australian hat on. Um, and so how to understanding the impacts of climate change in Kiribati is that it is literally at our doorstep. Um, the rising sea levels are a incredibly, um, dire straits at the moment in Kiribati. Everyone is surrounded with a seawall around their property. Um, the main island of Tarawa is at, it's about 40 kilometres long by, and at its widest is one kilometre wide. And they've never seen a climate crisis. They've never seen an ocean crisis like this before, especially in the last 20 years. It has just been increasing in sea level, um, this, the rising sea levels. Um, Kiribati, Bar One Island, um, which is Barnaba, Bar Barnaba, Bar Barnaba um, the land sits about, about three metres above sea level um, and climate, and sorry, with king tides are probably sitting at about 2.8 to 2.9 now. And so it is incredibly important that um, there is a lot of conversations about Kiribati people moving to Fiji and we are going to be climate refugees um, and it's a very real conversation to be having but I would say to respond and similarly to David to talk about empathy um, my role is to be sharing the stories of that culture and that we're not just people to only be speaking about as desperate and when you know climate affected communities especially indigenous communities we need to be speaking about maintaining their culture we need to be speaking about 
sharing who they are, not just as um, desperate people living at the edge of the world, um, which is often responded, spoken about with Kitabas people. So I would say there is a huge knowledge bank, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> of Indigenous knowledge, and there is a huge learning capacity for businesses. <coughs> pardon me. Um, there's a huge resource that we can be tapping into. And so I would be saying sharing and listening to Kitabast stories and Indigenous stories. Thank you so much, Marita. Next, we have Mitzi. Um, yeah, echoing what Marita kind of already mentioned, it's so important to uplift the stories of people who are most marginalized and most impacted and not in the way, when we talk about climate impacts, I'm very careful about this because so often activists and people from the global south are portrayed as these sad stories and statistics and um, climate impact, but we're not just that. And sometimes my pet peeve is really when people are like, oh, we're fighting for the voiceless or we'll be the voice for the voiceless. And I'm like, I have my own voice. I'm not a whale. I don't wanna hear that unless you're talking about whales and turtles. I, I have my own voice, amplify my voice. And my dogs are trying to drown out my voice now. But you know, we've we've experienced all these things where we've been tried like the climate crisis is drowning us out with the floods and the typhoons, and the our governments are also trying to drown us out and silence us because they're afraid of activists speaking up. And so that is the impact of climate change in our community. It's not just weather impacts, but it's also democracy. It's all these things coming together. And someone already mentioned earlier, it's about the intersectionality of all the social economic crises coming together, like racial racism and sexism and um, ableism and class inequality and fascism even. It's all these things coming together. And so when we're thinking of the impacts of the climate crisis, we have to remember that it's not just about extreme weather events. Like, yes, the Philippines is so vulnerable to the climate crisis. I grew up with typhoons at my doorstep and being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom, but that's not the only thing that makes the climate crisis so bad. Another thing is because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of um, ways to develop and the lack of support that we have from our national government, from our local government, and from the private sector. And so there's a lot of things that need to be done. And we can't think of the climate crisis as just weather and environment and emissions, but rather people and how it's impacting people and our voices. Thank you, Mitzi, so much. Moving over to Rashid. Um, so first of all, thank you to David and Marita for talking about the idea of empathy and not seeing people as desperate, right? Because I think that that speaks to a bigger saviorism um, issue within our communities. Um, but to get to the question, I live in a Black neighborhood in Philadelphia. So coming from that lens, right, um, climate change is historically linked to and strengthens racial and social hierarchies um, within our communities of people. Um, and our neighborhoods have higher rates of health disparities caused by like the release of harsh toxins into our neighborhoods. Um, so we have like huge, right, huge levels of like high blood pressure, asthma, and so many other things. And so naturally, how business choose to, you know, operate will affect us. Um, so how they choose to engage with like public policy affects us and the way they show up in the community that they occupy affects us and so much more. And then also, I think that climate change is more than, you know, I mean, climate change is more than what's just in the air. And I think that that's a very misconception, a very common misconception, right? right? Um, and it's also weather and natural disasters and food insecurity and the way that you operate and support community members after these things occur helps to reveal, you know, um, what your values truly are. Um, yeah. Thank you. Renee. Renee. Kausama Kunsa. In nuestra lengua originaria, Significa vida nuestra, nuestra. Eso eh, es muy importante para tratar de entender el por qué y qué y cómo debemos hacernos cargo del tiempo y el espacio en el que estamos viviendo. Entonces, 
lo más importante, no renegar, no al resentimiento, sí a la regeneración. Porque si hablamos de la regeneración, estamos hablando de la amor. Si hablamos de renegar, estamos hablando del odio, la pelea, la lucha, la guerra. Y como el abuelo nos decía, causa macunza, vida nuestra, el ego, el yo, debemos hacerlo descansar en estos momentos y recuperar el co para ser coherentes, para podernos convidar para poder compartir ¿qué? conocimientos adelanto científico pero también saberes que en este caso de los pueblos indígenas que no son patrimonio de los pueblos indígenas son patrimonio de los abuelos de todos nosotros porque si miramos para atrás todos nosotros tenemos el mismo abuelo, porque todos venimos de la especie humana, formamos parte de esa gran comunidad. Entonces eso nos lleva a establecer las prioridades. Cuando decimos qué es lo más importante de la comunidad empresarial, de la comunidad indígena, en realidad es importante para todos porque todos formamos parte de distintas comunidades. Es muy importante para la comunidad empresarial, para mi comunidad indígena, pero también lo más importante para nuestra comunidad, que es la tierra, que es el cosmos, eso que nuestros abuelitos nos han enseñado, la pacha mama, la madre tierra, la madre de la vida. Si nosotros entendemos eso, ya nos vienen las responsabilidades, que no tiene que ver con el odio, sino tiene que ver con el amor. Esa responsabilidad tiene que ver con esa necesidad de cambio. Entonces, hoy, ¿qué es lo que tenemos que cambiar? ¿Qué es lo que tenemos que regenerar? Son los modelos, los modelos de sobrevivencia, los modelos de convivencia, y ahí con negrita y asterisco, los modelos de gobernanza, los modelos de producción, y esto que es fundamental, los modelos de darle sentido a la vida, como decía Mitzi, mi, no, Mitz, como decía Mitzi, no es que los otros hablen por nosotros, el ser humano es el único ser que no debe ser representado, sino que debemos participar para hacernos cargo de esta realidad en la que estamos viviendo. Nosotros vivimos en el desierto. Creíamos que nunca iban a llegar las grandes empresas. Sin embargo, como en nuestro territorio está lo que hoy se llama el oro blanco, que es el litio, llegaron las empresas. Y ahora no debemos renegar, debemos hacernos cargo de esa realidad, porque hay distintas cuestiones, generan trabajo, pero el agua dulce se nos pone en riesgo y somos seres humanos que podemos aportar también ante esa realidad. Ahora... Um, ok, so I will start with Kausama Kunsa, which in, our, in indigenous tongue means our life ours. This is very important to understand and to understand the why, the what, and the how we need to take charge of the time and space we're living, of our life. Um, so the most important is not to renegade, is not to focus on resentment, is to focus on regeneration. Because if we talk about regeneration, we're talking about love. If we renegade, we're talking about hate, we're talking about war. And how my grandfather used to say, causama custa, our lives. We leave, need to leave egos aside and recuperate and recuperate the co which in spanish the alliteration for co works for the next following words um so recuperate the core to be coherent to cooperate to live together to share to share what 
knowledge, scientific advancement, um, and, and the knowledge that in this case is coming from indigenous people. That it is not just patrimony of indigenous people, but of all of us, because all of our grandfathers, if we look back, we all have the same grandfather. We all come from the same community, the human race. This leads us to establish priorities when we worry about what's most important. What's more important is for all of us to come together, businesses, indigenous communities, our communities, to come together for the land and the cosmos, for the Pachamama, the motherland. If we understand this, then we get responsibilities that are not to do with hate, but love. And these responsibilities come from with the need of change. Um, what we do need to change is to regenerate our models. We need to change and regenerate our, our models of survival, our models of living together, our models of governance, and our models of production. And it is fundamental to also change and regenerate the model of how we see life. As um, Mitzi mentioned, it is not about speaking for others. The human race should not be a race that it gets to be represented. We should participate and take charge of the realities we are living and speak from our realities. For example, we have lived in the desert for thousands of years and we thought that big businesses would never come, but they did because we have what it's called the white gold, um, the lithium. So now enterprises are here and we have to work together to protect the little resources that we have, such as fresh water. Great. Thank you so much. Bueno. We're going to move on to, to Coria next. Um, okay. Um, I guess Huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, without sounding kind of redundant, uh, I have like similar points as a lot of the points that others have made. Um, so I guess I could just add in by just saying that I think one of the most important things that businesses should understand about the impacts on climate change, um, especially as it relates to the community, is that they can leverage their influence in many ways uh, to help advocate for public policy changes on a local level, um, especially with how they impact the communities that they operate in. And um, I feel that there is a sense of like social responsibility um, that a lot of businesses have to um, hold themselves accountable to, especially if they are gonna be operating in communities where uh, where their operation is making communities a lot more vulnerable. Um, so I think that they do have to take a sense of responsibility for those communities that they're impacting. Um, and when they're entering into agreements uh, to, uh, to have their businesses in like certain areas, um, there's a whole lot of ways that they can get involved just in like the planning process, getting involved in like climate action plans that most like cities and counties incorporate um, anyway and develop um, and develop like on their own businesses have a lot of influence on that um, and how they plan on and what they can like make a, a requirement for them like giving their business to like a certain community, um, especially with just um, entering into like community benefit agreements. I feel like that's uh, something really important that the business community should understand. Um, but again, that starts with just like educating themselves and then just not just ed educating themselves and their leadership, but educating their internal, um, like their, inter their whole internal business as well. Um, so that everyone is informed and they understand uh, the ways in which that they're contributing to climate justice and vulnerability in communities so that they're all kind of like working in tandem uh, to create more equitable solutions. Um, but yeah, I would just say that they have a lot more leverage and influence on um, local policy um, than they exercise. Thank you everyone for those initial answers and I appreciate that many of your responses were in conversation with one another and that they actually led into some of the other questions that we had hoped to address this morning. And so in the interest of time, I wanna make sure that there's an opportunity for folks to be in conversation with one another. And so were there any thoughts that were sparked for you by the comments of our fellow panelists here that you wanna either follow up on or address? I would actually, I Please. wanted to Gladys made a really good point about um, how businesses are, uh, how there's actually like growth opportunities 
um, when it comes to like for uh, what was she saying? She was saying um, about uh, companies and communities being able to adapt um, and basically like becoming more resilient. Um, when companies kind of like make that commitment to transition to like a uh, zero net like greenhouse gases or when they're like remodeling or um, innovating their businesses to be more um, environmentally conscious and more sustainable um, that actually leads to millions of jobs because it uh, increases that like green job space um, which I think like the projections show like in the next 10 years if businesses do start to do that, I think that we can see like an increase in like 65 million jobs in the green space alone. Um, so I think that, so there is a cost um, impact in that as well. And I think that instead of businesses thinking of like how they can lose money um, because sometimes money is the deterring factor of whether or not people choose to care about issues or not. Um, so I feel like um, that's what I kind of just wanted to piggyback off of and just uh, encouraging businesses to know that this can lead to uh, stimulating the economy through job growth and also just business innovation in general. Um, so there's opportunity in that space for your business to continue to grow and adapt um, as opposed to thinking that this is like an end uh, to like the productivity and the growth of your business. Thank you, Takora. Yeah, Mark, please. Well, I liked uh, hearing the personal perspectives of, of Marita and Mitzi and Renee. Um, their, their, their personal experience is so different from mine because I live in a desert where drought is, is such a huge issue. So I think that storytelling, um, really that personalization really makes a big difference. Wonderful. So I'd love to get a sense from all of you, you know, where would you hope that the business community can start focusing its energy as it works on climate justice? And we've heard some great examples already thinking about policy, thinking about partnerships, thinking about listening to communities. Are there other things you'd want to see folks who are in the business world starting to do and focusing their time, attention and resources that would have a really big impact on your community or in the world in general? Fatima, back to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I could not refer to everyone because everybody <laughs> made like such good points that I was like writing down. Um, I think that um, perhaps also thinking, I, I mentioned before, right, that if I speak from the perspective of Ecosia, we kind of always see like when we talk about community, we're talking about the community of tree plantains and we're also talking about the users of our product, which who mostly are also in the global north. Um, we talked a lot about, and I think uh, Rene mentioned it, and uh, Tikori did it uh, did as well about passing the mic, which uh, the mic microphone, which also Mitzi mentioned. Um, I think that I would like businesses. I think a lot of businesses have been doing this, uh, at least in the big corporate community, and also uh, talking about social businesses, uh, at least around Europe. They, there has been a little bit of a transition and that's really positive, that's good. In the past year, two years, there has been more and more um, movements trying to yeah, amplify voices. That's super positive and I would definitely like to see more businesses doing this. Also internally within their own teams, not just externally. I think I've, what I've, from what I've seen, this is happening. Um, but I would also like businesses that are dealing with the topic of climate justice to, to also go a little bit beyond that and recognize, um, which goes a little bit along the lines of what Renee was mentioning, recognize that we have, we have the, the entire system is not working uh, for anyone. And, and it's even worse for uh, so-called marginalized communities. And uh, depending on who you are, where you are, you're going to suffer that system more or less. But really, um, the, in the name of uh, more regeneration, as Renee was saying, uh, and the name also of abandoning hate uh, and rather uh, embracing understanding and creating 
bridges among different uh, groups. I, th I would like to see more businesses underlining that also towards their, uh, that if we're talking about users or community of users in the, in the global north to underline that there is much more in common between anyone wherever we are global south or north there's much more that we have in common in terms of this capitalist system not working for anyone than we have uh, in contrast and so i would like more businesses to to say that out loudly more clearly and to underline uh that um especially again uh, underlining a lot the, the role of a company in the global north um that um it's not about um it's not only so, so we, we talked about sympathy and empathy definitely it is about empathy but it's also not about saving anyone but rather recognizing the failure in the system for everyone and recognizing your part in in in, in moving changing that system and um and empower everyone to 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 do that to help do that so um i, I think i would like to see businesses that are dealing with that with there who are very honestly looking at themselves and think about climate justice to not only do so externally but also internally and think about how to how to go beyond that because um a, a lot of movements in the business community that I that I've seen sometimes do have an aftertaste of saviorism and 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 I think that if we're going to deal with climate justice we need to create bridges not sometimes allyship so-called allyship can can be misunderstood as a little bit of a saviorism that is just really rooted in the same logic of racism so I would like that to change. Thank you so much, Fatima. Mark? I think once climate justice is clearly defined, the focus is probably somewhat situational. I'll borrow from human resources and the term onboarding, where new employees are eased into their new employer's culture. I think once climate justice is defined, onboarding, in this context is making sure employees, executives and board members know. It's making sure creditors and investors know. It's making sure their supply chain and their customers know. Focusing on situationally defining uh, climate justice uh, and then focusing on onboarding the entire network and the community that business is such a crucial part of is really key, I think and getting as many on board as possible. And I do think, uh, by the way, B Corps have uh, such a framework for accomplishing that. So I'll turn that over to David. Thank you, Mark. Um, to get to onboard people onto this train of climate justice, I think what business community should really focus on is communication. And Mark, in, in your words just now about storytelling, and as shared uh, by Charlotte just now in the climate justice uh, playbook, it, it stated that generally there's a lack of understanding, uh, which is why uh, for us, um, we have focused a lot of our energy on consumer engagement. Uh, we're trying to balance marketing, education and advocacy. But we're, we're not, you know, we don't want to be so out there and um, aggressive about this message to the consumer because that sometimes might turn people away. Uh, we also recognize that the knowledge gap is actually very, very real. And, and whether we like it or not, uh, we do have to realize that consumption is power. And if we are able to influence consumer pattern in a positive manner, then it does have a potential to change uh, upstream activities and you know, move it towards uh, more sustainable practices. So again, I think uh, business community in this area, when we talk about climate justice. Uh, I did mention to Dan that uh, the word justice does sound a little bit strong, but communication is really key because if the audience that we're trying to reach couldn't understand what we are trying to convey, then it's really difficult for us to drive any impact. Moving to Gladys. Yeah, thank you very much, David. And I'll just pick it up from there. Uh, speaking about communication, uh, I think for us, how we are actually up 
approach or, or support, uh, say, businesses and investors we work with, we look at it from the lens of, uh, you know, is it a human-centered approach? Is it possible uh, for you to actually uh, safeguard or, or include, say, the most vulnerable and marginalized uh, communities, say, in your strategy or in, in your operations? And in this case, uh, say, for instance, is this um, narrative around the base of the pyramid? Uh, so we, we, we mainly focus on, is it possible for a business, um, be it uh, in their supply chain, in, in, in their service delivery or in their product delivery, is it possible for them to think about uh, the consumers or the, the people, the BOP, uh, the base of the pyramid in this in, 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 as they're doing their day-to-day -day operations. So because we realize that like, for instance, climate justice is centered around how do we actually safeguard and include uh, the most vulnerable. And in this case, we find we have people with disability, we have young people, we have elderly people, uh, people of low income who, who are really earning less income, uh, who really been affected by climate change. So is it possible for businesses to design their strategy or even in delivery of what they do on day-to-day -day basis to include this uh, vulnerable vulnerable communities and we work a lot with refugees uh, and and we've seen really like for instance in 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 Kenya we really host a really big population of refugees from from the neighboring countries south sudan and what have you as well as marginalized communities living in those uh, affected areas and and so we see that this is a co a community that um has really not been uh, incorporated, say, in, in policy or even in, in government planning when it comes to service delivery. And we've seen there's a lot of um, uh, non-governmental organizations who are working with these communities. But then there's also an opportunity in which that the business community is actually now uh, supplying, say, products and services or even employing some of these things. Like, for instance, in some of the refugee camps, you know, you're allowed to even have an ID and you're able to really get a job. So one of the things we, we tell as even as we work with communities in this in these regions in the marginalized regions we advocate is it possible for you to integrate have employees or even have people within your supply chain who are from this uh, marginalized community and of course maybe in the second uh, what we also do is we work closely with investors and we see that uh, the fact that ESG is really taking a center stage in how investors are really making the decision and here when you talk about climate justice is putting people at the center of uh, you know of, of this decision making and so we see that uh, you know the, uh, you've talked about knowledge. Yeah, there's really need for the investment community to understand, as even as they are do, uh, doing the due diligence of the companies they want to invest in. Is it possible for them to look for these issues even as as part of their as of their screening and due diligence? I think this is really an opportunity for the business community to take on board. We are seeing people looking at gender. We are seeing people look at youth integration being involved in this. Uh, in, in decision re making really being a key step in which the business community uh, is taking towards uh, ensuring inclusion and everybody is really being uh, taken into consideration. So I see there's really a big opportunity and if at all the business community focuses on these tenets of social inclusion, of, of, of putting people at the center stage of, of, of decision making, especially the most vulnerable and the marginalized will be able to safeguard their rights and of course, in a way, eliminate poverty and you know, ensure that uh, businesses are not only thriving, but they're having, uh, you know, a socially, we are living in a socially just, uh, you know, ecosystem and community. So over to the next uh, person. That's Marita. Thank you so much, Gladys. Um, Gladys, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I was just nodding and smiling along, so thank you so much. Um, and following on from that, not that I can really add much to it, I feel, um, my sort of first response to this question was just you absolutely must, 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 must have a diverse leadership team. I just, I, it, I feel so strongly about that. And when I'm speaking about climate justice um, and what does it relate to that, I think once you start having a diverse leadership team, you can start having employees that feel supported because they should all be diverse and people start to have, you're starting to facilitate a culture within your workplace of, that is diverse and that is that listens to different voices. Um, climate justice just can't be meaningfully done 
without diverse voices in the room. And so I really do think businesses, as well as looking externally, I'm going to focus on internally. They need to be looking at their own leadership boards. They need to be looking at the clients they're working with, the audiences they engage with, their employees. You can't look outside yourself if you only see yourself in the leadership team. I would strongly urge um, for it to be part of their internal strategy that they should be asking themselves this question at least twice a year that what should where should they be focusing their energies on um, rather than sort of asking the question and going we don't know like they need to be asking that hard question continuously um, <clears throat> pardon me and also to go on with um, me advocating for storytelling I would try and ensure um, a culture of storytelling within your business. So this, I can see this um, by addressing this is perhaps a lot of the content that you're sharing within the teams, a lot of the content that you're sharing with your clients, a lot of stories and, you know, even if it's TikTok or memes or Instagram profiles, you really need to be doing a self audit and be, looking at these pe looking at these different avenues and saying are these people diverse that we're listening to how can we make it more diverse does it challenge our own belief systems what makes me feel uncomfortable and how do i identify that and how how is it helping us all to be better listeners so um i would probably say yeah diverse leadership teams and start and start looking internally of what is the stories that you're sharing and what are the voices that you're elevating internally and then look outward. Really sage advice from everyone so far. Thank you. Moving over to Mitzi. Um, Gladys mentioned something I was thinking of also and I already answered also earlier. So safeguarding and including the most vulnerable people. Part of the most vulnerable communities to the climate crisis are workers, your workers. So focus your energy also in making sure that your workers' policies are just and look at the supply and distribution chain of your company. And if like Fatima, you guys already see that capitalism isn't working for majority of us, then join us and pressure bigger multinational businesses, which are also the major polluters to, to finally prioritize people in planet and nonprofit. I've seen um, the B Corps values, uh, the B Corps climate values, and you can see there that there's a admittance that the private sector is the reason why the climate crisis is happening. This systemic profit-oriented overproduction wasteful system is the reason why this is happening. And so you need to grow that and make sure that it doesn't stay just within you guys and within the people who are already progressive, but also people who don't understand and people who don't see this. And that way we can actually start having just transitions for our workers and for our society. Thank you, Mitzi. Uh, Rashid. Um, businesses should be examining their internal functions. So they should be thinking about who they give their business to, as well as question the companies that help them maintain everyday tasks, doing the work um, to help the environment, right? Um, see how they're standing up for justice. And also jobs are a very big thing. And like Marita said, the people leading those teams are equally important. Um, a lot of times we see those who were affected by these environmental issues also have a lack of support, right? And so they should be actively offering jobs to people in those communities where they are taking up space. Otherwise, they are just collecting money and benefits from that community and receiving great input, but there is really no output, right? Um, and it's also important to highlight the health disparities that we've mentioned before. Um, if these folks don't have the good jobs that are going to support them. They can't pay their hospital bills or their bills, period. They can't support themselves or overcome food shortages um, that are also caused by climate change. Like I work at a neighborhood community development center here in Philadelphia, um, and there's an influx of businesses and developments that come into the neighborhood and that the residents usually oppose all the time. Um, and sadly, our neighbors don't always get the requests but we have seen um, what is called a community benefits agreement, like Tecoria was talking about, um, where they offer the community a service and that will support the lifestyles of the people there. So the businesses, they may offer like free bike use or some may help connect you with like home weatherization programs or 
community gardens, or some may even provide community fridges. Um, but they have to begin educating themselves on this matter, right? The link in climate change and social, social disparity is quite expansive. So there's a lot to cover, but if you have the willingness to be anti-racist and serious about climate change, then you'll do whatever it takes, right? Um, and this could also be a potential opportunity to connect with community members and see how they believe climate change is affecting them. Wonderful, thank you. Renee, on to you. Justicia climática, que tema, no? Para todos. La justicia climática es un proceso de afuera hacia adentro de imposición o es un proceso de adentro hacia afuera. Son algunas preguntas que son claves para entender, porque la comunidad empresarial está integrada por humanos, como, por humanos, como todo, todas las comunidades. Entonces creo que en estos tiempos de regeneración debemos generar procesos de adentro hacia afuera, porque la justicia climática no es otra cosa que la equidad, el equilibrio, la armonía, algo tan simple para recuperar. Entonces, primero, respeto. Segundo, generar confianza. Tercero, conversar. Mi abuelo decía, hablando se entiende la gente. Una sola cabeza siempre se equivoca. Muchas cabezas tratan de hacer las cosas bien. Eh, creo que tenemos que empezar a conversar con la comunidad empresarial. Porque el abuelo también decía... Las cosas no se dicen, las cosas se hacen, porque cuando se hacen, las cosas se dicen solas. Entonces, hacernos cargo primero nosotros del poncho que tenemos que salir y convidar. Entonces, concretamente, nosotros desde Pueblos Originales ya vamos teniendo varias reuniones dentro de nuestro entorno, que serían las grandes empresas de Argentina, hace un par de semanas estuvimos reunidos, no para imponerles nada, sino para convidarles esta mirada, como decía Gladys, como decía Mitzi, nosotros no necesitamos que alguien hable por nosotros, si es nuestra responsabilidad hacerlo. Entonces fuimos, con respeto nos sentamos, ¿qué le, qué le tratamos de, de ¿Qué, ¿De qué conversamos? De que nuestros ancestros tenían una mirada diferente del trabajo que del modelo actual. Porque nosotros actualmente, este modelo de empleo, nosotros entendemos todavía la esclavitud encubierta. Nuestros ancestros tenían el modelo de la minga, que es el trabajo alegre, donde uno va por una responsabilidad espiritual de poder compartir con los otros, de, de generar reciprocidad, de generar intercambio. Eso es la minga. En cambio, cuando uno es empleado, tiene un techo, porque tiene que estar sujeto a lo que le diga el jefe, y el jefe al que diga el político de turno, y el que diga el político de turno de los grandes organismos internacionales. Y así vamos generando un mundo de arriba para abajo y se va destruyendo cada vez más lo de abajo. Entonces creo que si queremos generar justicia climática, primero tenemos que generar justicia en nosotros, que es armonía entre lo que sentimos, armonía entre lo que sentimos desde el corazón y lo que pensamos desde la cabeza para cambiar el a ser con ese, cambiar el ser para hacer cosas diferentes, porque si no, no va a haber cambio de modelos. Y en eso también coincido con Rashid, eh, que decía, eh, hay algunos que hacen negocio con este tema, sí, porque lo ponen en el marketing, entonces y ponen una certificación, una B, y entonces aumentan las ventas. Entonces es muy importante tratar este tema del impacto entre lo que producimos y lo que consumimos. Si nosotros nos hacemos cargo de ese impacto, y bueno, vamos a ir por el triple impacto primero, el económico, 
porque no es que si uno hace eh, impacto social pierda plata, no, tiene que ser en armonía con el, con el impacto social. Y no es que si uno trabaja por la gente va a terminar rompiendo la naturaleza. Se puede hacer el impacto económico, social y, y ecológico en forma armónica. So climate justice is a very difficult subject um, for all. Climate justice is a process. Uh, is it a process from the outside being imposed or from the inside towards the outside? This is for me the key to understanding because the business community is made by humans. In these times, we need to develop processes from the inside out because climate justice has to do with equity, with equilibrium and harmony. And this is something that is easy to recuperate. So first, uh, my message is that we need to come from a point of respect. Second, generate trust. And third, talk talk to each other. My grandfather used to say that one, that we can understand each other by talking to each other. One head makes mistakes. Many heads can get things right. I think we need to talk with the business community because my grandfather said that things are, that are not, that you should not say things, you should do things. And the things that are done are things that are then said. So we need to go and have this conversation. For us, we went and talked to the businesses in Argentina and not to impose our knowledge, not to impose what we were thinking, but to share, to share that ancestral knowledge and the way that our ancestors thought about, about the way that our ancestors thought about work. And that was through the Minga, which was a joyful work to generate reciprocity through the Minga. But when we are thinking about current business models, we think about, you know, you're an employee and then you have a, buff, a, a, a boss and then you have the person on top of that and then you have the government on top of that. So like what we're talking is that you have um, a, a world that is thought from the top down, from the top bottom and where we're doing is destroying the bottom. So if we want climate justice, we need justice also for ourselves. We need harmony between what we feel and what we think. And for that, we need to, and in that way, we can generate uh, change from the self. Um, and I agree with many of the things that have been said, that it's not just about talking about climate justice to then increase profit or to generate more money or to seem like have a, like a tick mark or a sticker saying that you're doing this. We need to really think about how we produce, how we consume, and the impact that we're having in the social, the ecological, and find a way to, to create harmony amongst each other. Thank you so much. We'll go next to Decoria before we wrap up. All righty. Um, I think, well, I think a good starting point anyway, uh, because there's a lot of things that businesses should be focusing on, especially as it relates to climate justice. Um, but again, I feel like everybody was also speaking, like everybody was education piece and how that's really important. Um, yeah. And I oh, to Corey, you um, just went on to mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, I just wanted to say that a lot of people were touching on that lack of education, um, especially within like a lot of like these larger businesses and these corporations. Um, and I think a really good starting point um, that businesses can kind of like a general like climate risk and vulnerability assessment. I think that's a really good starting point for a lot of businesses as far as like focusing and harnessing their energy. And then once they're able to do that, um, and just really uh, compile the data. Because again, when you're thinking of business, they're always about, oh, where's the data to support your arguments or things like that. So, <laughs> so it's like once they have the data in front of them and they can really understand the communities that they're impacting, all the other stakeholders that also share an impact in what they're doing, um, and then just really identifying those structural inequities. I feel like, um, and then even just like speaking to some of the uh, 
things that I see in the community that I work in specifically. Um, and again, like Rashid was speaking on this also, like making sure that we are supporting like small disadvantaged businesses that are in these areas that they're operating in, um, because uh, the e economics also play a role in the climate injustice and vulnerability of these communities. Um, like I was saying before, like entering into community benefit agreements for residents, uh, Rashid also like spoke on this as well. Um, but and uh, uh, Fatima was also talking about this as well. Tree cover, especially urban tree cover, um, is crucial for a lot of um, residents uh, that are impacted by climate injustice. Um, in my own community here in Howard County, um, every single summer we have a tremendous spike in people just dying from heat strokes. Um, because of the lack of tree canopy in the areas that um, they live in. And that's something that businesses can impact when they're uh, building partnerships with communities to move into certain areas. They can have some type, some type of agreement where if they are able to come into this community, then they should try, uh, they should provide like urban tree cover. Um, and even just with like transportation inequity, or even if they're operating within food deserts, like what is something that they can give to the community, whether that be like a community garden or whether that be collaborating with CSAs. Um, that's another thing that we're trying to work on, getting uh, businesses to buy shares um, from like local CSAs so that they can just donate that food to the people that like actually need it. Um, so I feel like if businesses, and I feel like it all just comes to like that community engagement piece. If businesses are just really dedicating uh, their time to really including the vulnerable populations um, in their practices, in their policies, and just considering them in all the things that they do, um, I would say that that's really something that they should focus their energy on. And if they don't have some type of like team or a task force that's dedicated um, to analyzing that and acting on that, then every business should uh, incorporate that into their business model and their infrastructure. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. I want to be respectful of your time and acknowledge that folks are in all different parts of the world, so it may be very early or very late for some of you. Uh, but thank you all so much for the beautiful contributions and thoughtful perspectives that you've brought to today's conversation. I'm particularly excited that although we had originally had four questions for you, uh, you had answered many of them organically through the process of your answers. And so those questions of what would you like to say to the business community that is currently working on climate justice and what would be most impactful to you and your community, I think were well represented in the conversation. And just want to invite that this is not the end of the conversation, but rather just the beginning. So that we will certainly have more time in June during the conference for folks to continue picking up on these themes. And just want to say thank you again so much for your time, your generosity and your wisdom. So we will wrap up our time today and just with a lot of gratitude, wishing you all well.